morning we started off with the people who are impacted who use water. Um, John's presentation told us where we are, where we're going in the future. And now um, this panel is going to talk about how they've been adapting to uh, a change in climate and um, tools and resources that they've used. So um, with that, I'd like to um, introduce our moderator, Dr. Gabrielle Roche-McNally, and she's a fellow with the Climate Hubs. Um, I thought she'd be the perfect person to um, moderate this session. She's a sociologist, works with the Sustainable Corn Project, and we're super happy to have her back in the Pacific Northwest with the Climate Hubs. So. Thank you, Liz. And thank all of you for being here. I think more than ever, it's important to be having these conversations. And uh, it's, it's exciting to me to see all of the um, important work that folks are doing in their regions to adapt to and respond to climate risks. So thanks for having me, and thanks for being here. So I'm just going to present our three presenters in one go, and then let them come up here uh, to give their presentations. We have a nice panel of folks who are uh, taking some interesting um, tax to addressing water scarcity. So our first presenter is Amy Garrett, who is currently working for OSU Extension Small Farms Program in Southern Willamette Valley. Uh, she is working on drought mitigation tools and strategies for growing with little or no irrigation, which has really become a focus of her work in the past several years. The dry farmer project she is leading has expanded over the past year to include several dry farming demonstration sites in Oregon, a growing resilience water management workshop series, and participatory dry farming research with interested growers throughout the Pacific Northwest. I'm just I will see you may talk a few times on this project, and I think it's a really good example example of engaging producers in participatory research to adapt to this uncertainty in their region. So it's exciting. Uh, our second presentation is Steve Shively. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly, um, who is a fourth generation farmer born and raised in Mud Lake, Idaho. Before he was old enough to help his dad and grandfather run equipment, he spent his days farming the toy tractors in the basement uh, with the carpet as his field. Uh, today, Steve Shively Custom Farming runs nearly 2,000 acres and is comprised of Steve, his father, and a co-worker. Some of the ground currently being farmed has been in the Shively name for over 70 years. As the, as the years and technology changes, Steve is active in implementing new methods such as low elevation spray application irrigation program, which he's going to tell us more about today. And then our final presentation is Jacques Leroux, and he started his career as an irrigation consultant in South Africa in 1996 and in 2003, 2003 registered the Eonet LLC in Washington and later in Oregon. Eonet provides IWM services, irrigation water management, do I have that right? <laughs> um, hardware and software in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and California. Eonet was also involved with research projects in collaboration with OSU and the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. Uh, Eonet was also registered as a technical services provider for the Energy Trust of Oregon and the Bonneville Power Administration and delivers reports to these organizations as well as to the USDA uh, for the assessment of water and energy savings related to the payment of incentive programs, uh, program funding to growers. So great panel of folks. Uh, we'll invite Amy up here first. Hello, and uh, thank you so much for organizing this conference, Liz, and having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Dry Farming Collaborative project I've been working on for the past, uh, well, the Dry Farming Collaborative came about in the past year, but this project has really been happening. Um, it's kind of evolved over the past three years or so. So this kind of started, I'm, um, March marks my sixth year working for the OSU Extension Service in the Southern Willamette Valley. And one of the most common questions we get through the Extension Office is, I just moved onto this piece of property and I'm trying to figure out what I can grow here. And I discovered over time that a majority of the people I was talking with uh, were on land without water rights or limited water availability or in the, in, the, within the drought in 2015, many people were cut off early who were used to irrigating throughout the growing season. So uh, when I'm talking about dry farming, I'm referring to crop production during a dry season, just like our summers in the Willamette Valley, uh, and also like Northern California, the Mediterranean, so where we have this dry summer and then a wet, cool winter. 
and we're relying on residual soil moisture uh, from the rainy season and utilizing a variety of techniques to conserve that soil for crop production in the summer instead of depending on supplemental irrigation. So there, uh, when I started um, exploring this topic a bit, there uh, were some, a variety of resources out there. Steve Solomon has written several books and talked about uh, dry farming or growing without irrigation. Carol Deppi has written uh, The Resilient Gardener and talks about different strategies for growing without irrigation as well. And then uh, we hear a lot about dry land farming uh, and in Eastern Oregon and in Washington uh, with grains. So, but I'm gonna be focusing on um, mostly vegetable crops. And there are some people in the Dry Farming Collaborative doing uh, fruit crops as well. Uh, another resource when I was first starting in this area, um, the California Ag Water Stewardship Initiative has a website and a dry farming page. So that's where uh, one of my initial uh, kind of contacts was some folks in California that were doing work that way. And then there's um, text from like the early 1900s on dry farming from people like John Witso. So the work to date for this project were uh, case studies. I did case studies with farmers. Uh, I'll tell you about a couple of them here in a moment in uh, Western Oregon and also five different farms in Northern California that have been uh, dry farming a variety of fruits and vegetables. Uh, we did some demonstration. Our first demonstration was in the drought year in 2015 where I took some practices that I learned from uh, visiting with these farmers and I thought, well, I'll try this myself and we'll see you know, how it does and maybe we'll have a field day. So um, I'll show you some pictures of the field day and talk a bit about that in a moment. Um, we did uh, taste testings at these field days, like did side-by-side -side testings of dry farmed and irrigated um, tomatoes and melons. And we also have pursued grant funding and have been um, somewhat successful. Uh, we got a small um, grant to do this Growing Resilience Water Management Workshop Series, which several of those sessions were video recorded and available on our website. And I'll show you that at the end on my last slide. And then the part that I'll be focusing on primarily is this participatory dry farming um, research that we're doing with growers. And that is definitely building momentum. So this is uh, Jeannie Berg with your hometown harvest. She was one of the first farmers that I met who was um, on, farming on land with, um, she had one acre of water rights. And in order to expand her crop production, she was experimenting with a deep straw mulch in, um, with her tomatoes and her squash. So she was experimenting and I case studied her in a small farm news article. And then I met um, a farmer in Veneta. He had been in, he had farmed in California for 30 years and has retired in Veneta, which is in Lane County in the southern, southern Willamette Valley. And uh, he had 40 years of experience uh, dry farming tomatoes, potatoes, dry beans, melons, um, a variety of crops. So I uh, case studied, uh, I would visit him monthly throughout the growing season, take pictures and kind of just look at how he was doing things. I'm like, wow, this really um, would be useful information for the people that I'm talking to on the phone that are on land without water and um, that are exploring what crops um, they might be able to grow. And then I met a dry bean farmer in Elmira and he had, um, so the previous two farmers had limit, the first one was limited water rights, second one had no water rights. And this guy in Elmira, um, Al, he has water rights, but he uses dry farming as a tool to stagger his harvest. His dry farmed beans are the first to be harvested. The ones that are irrigated once are next. The one that are, ones that are irrigated twice follow up. So as a one-man operation, he's able to stagger his harvest and use dry farming as a tool. So um, some of the strategies or techniques that the dry farmers I visited with are using, um, they're, they're starting uh, on a site, uh, on a soil that has good water holding capacity. So there's clay content, uh, organic matter, uh, and we know for each 1% increase in organic, soil organic matter, you increase your soil's water holding capacity greatly. Uh, Steve Solomon recommends four feet of soil or more, so we're not starting on shallow, uh, sandy, or gravelly soils. We have deep soils with good water holding capacity that we're growing on. Um, and you can use different uh, techniques for selecting a site, like looking at a site over a whole calendar year. Where in August are your blackberries most luscious? And you know, um, also we pulled five foot soil cores out of each of our dry farming sites to look at what the soil profile looks like five feet deep versus just that top few inches because dry farm crops are rooting much deeper. 
Um, crop and variety selection are also key. Um, we, you, the crops and varieties that we selected for our dry farming trials were some of which were from uh, dry farm systems. So there's a dry farm plant breeder in Northern California I got connected with, um, Bill Reynolds. And he, um, he has a variety of, um, well, some squash and some melons and zucchini that definitely stood out in our trials. So crop and variety selection and ones that come from dry farm systems uh, were definitely, um, those stood out in our trials. Um, soil preparation and timing of uh, soil preparation is really key. Like, so st not starting in June, um, we're starting as early as possible. Um, and trying to, like, not letting the cover crop grow to be uh, shoulder height and go into full flower, because that's, we're designing around our limiting resource, which in dry farming is water. So we're trying to conserve that water. So cover crop is typically taken down a little earlier and incorporated, and then we want to get in and plant while there's still moisture in the soil. Um, another thing that we do is, um, with dry farming is, um, increase plant spacing. So a good rule of thumb for like people just starting out is to double um, the spacing or um, that you would do in an irrigated situation. Um, also pressing the seed or soil around the, um, around the seed or transplant. Um, that, soil, that picture here in the um, bottom right shows um, kind of pressing in the soil just around the uh, tomato transplant there. Or I saw farmers stepping the seed in. They drop it in and then just kind of compress it just around where the plant is, not all around, but just in that spot. And just like when you look back on a field of loose soil that you walked across and notice like your footprints, um, you know, there's capillary action and uh, you'll notice your footprints are wet even though the surface of the soil looks dry. So that's the capillary action, wicking that moisture to the surface to help the seed get established. Carol Deppi uh, recommends pre-soaking seed before planting, and that helps um, things get started. I haven't tried that yet myself. Uh, and then surface protection. Uh, on a small scale, some people are doing mulching techniques, um, but on the large field scale at the commercial farms, they're um, keeping that top few inches loose, creating this, um, some people uh, cringe at the word dust mulch, but um, dust mulch is what I think most people call it. So this is a stylized il illustration uh, by Moria Peters of what dust mulch looks like. And on the right there, you can see um, a sandy soil. And on the left, you see um, a, a kind of a silty soil with clay. So there's, um, there's better capillarity in uh, soils that aren't sandy because uh, there's smaller particle sizes. You can see some worm activity there. And there's water traveling up those channels and um, moving to the surface. And this is just an illustration that she did showing kind of um, the roots as the soil dries down. Since we're not irrigating, they're, uh, they're, they're going much deeper. And just as that soil dries down, uh, the roots extend to the edge of that saturated zone. So these are just some pictures from um, my case studies and, and dry farm uh, site visits uh, showing some of the crops. On the bottom right, you can see Jacques Newcomb, and he's at Newcomb uh, Family Farm in Willow Creek, California. And he came to the Small Farms Conference last year and was one of our presenters. And that session's video recorded on our website. But uh, he's known for his dry farm peaches and melons um, at the Arcata Farmers Market. And he uh, tells a great story of his son um, counting 50 people in line a half hour before the market started waiting for his peaches and melons. So. There's, um, there's a flavor, uh, of the kind of a people who uh, taste uh, the dry farm produce um, are very loyal customers for these farmers because they, they do stand out in flavor. Um, so the 2015 dry farming demonstration, that was, uh, I mentioned, that was me, my kind of first go at like applying some of the, what I've learned from these farmers um, on the ground. I was like, well, we'll see, we'll see if anything grows. And um, there were some standout crops, like the Dark Star Zucchini was a dry farmed crop that um, from mid-July through late September, without any irrigation, we direct seeded it. It jumped out of the ground, uh, and it cranked out zucchini starting in mid-July, like more than we could handle. Um, and the picture on the right is, so the pictures all on the left are from our dry farming plot in Corvallis. And on the right is a Dark Star Zucchini field in Northern California. So um, there's definitely something special about that. And there's a story um, in that presentation on our website. Um, 
the story of how that zucchini was bred. So there's some battle. That's definitely uh, part of our future plans for this project is learning more and developing more um, dry farmed varieties. I'm going to cruise along here. I got my sign here. Five more minutes. So we had a field day, expected 20 people to show up, and um, we had more than 100 people show up in the drought year. So while um, John was mentioning the fires in Washington in August, and people were um, kind of, the question I got most of that field day was, so how many times did you irrigate? I'm like, well, we didn't, we actually, you know, this was dry farmed, and um, so people kind of marveled at that this was even a possibility. And so the project really gained momentum having this demonstration in the drought year. Um, and then um, multiple people followed up to a survey. Um, uh, well, in the taste test, people ranked the tomatoes and uh, melons um, higher than in the categories of color, texture, and sweetness. But the part that really stuck out to me is that um, uh, in the follow-up survey that, that was sent to 29 people, 93% uh, of them intended to apply what they learned on their land. So this gave birth to the Dry Farming Collaborative. And, so we expanded the project in 2016 to three sites. Um, we had this Growing Resilience Water Management Workshop Series. Um, this is a little diagram at the bottom of what we did at the small site that I uh, organ or, um, planted and um, collected data on. So we had irrigated, low irrigation, dry farmed, and then dry farmed with biochar compost. This is just a little snapshot of what things looked like um, mid-June, mid-July, and then August. We had a field day, again, more than 100 people showed up. Um, the Dry Farming Collaborative, we're a group of growers, extension educators, plant breeders, and ag professionals that are partnering to increase knowledge and awareness of, these, um, of this approach to farming. Uh, we had 10 main sites hosting trials in 2016 throughout Western Oregon. Uh, we grew from, we just started a Facebook page um, in the spring, so it hasn't even been on for a year, and we have 140, more than 140 members last I checked. And we have 80 plus people on our email list. Um, we collected data at a variety of sites and learned a lot of things about how we might do things in the future and how not to do things next time. Um, so we're still working out uh, how to do collaborative, you know, um, get meaningful data from um, various research plots with different people involved. Um, I won't have time to talk in a great deal about this, but I'd be happy to after. Um, this is just a snapshot of um, our potato uh, yield, and you can see across the bottom we are different treatments, uh, dry farmed, dry farmed with biochar compost, low irrigation and irrigated, and uh, we graded out the potatoes. We had two varieties, the Yukon Gold and the Yellow Fin. Um, so given my time constraints, I'm just going to flip through this, but we, this will be available afterwards, and I'd be happy to talk more. So this is our squash shield, and just to note that the Stella Blue is a dry farm variety. Zeppelin Delicata is not. The dry farm varieties stood out uh, repeatedly over and over. They um, are clearly adapted to the dry farm system, and that shows in the yield and in the quality. Uh, the Christmas watermelon. Um, a note here, real quick on the melons. On the right, um, you can see at the top the Christmas watermelon, and the bottom the Eel River melon. Um, the irrigated Eel River melon, you notice from the purple there, was like a crop failure. That's a dry. Both of these are dry farm varieties, and the irrigated Eel River got some sort of disease, and they completely died. So, these dry farmed um, varieties thrive in dry farm situations and don't necessarily like irrigation. And this is a, was the first attempt with our kind of sloppy kind of data to like analyze across sites. So the top site is in Philomath, Oregon. Then we had one in Aurora, which is in the northern Willamette Valley, and in Oak Creek. And these were tomatoes. We had three different varieties, and they weren't all planted at each site. But um, you can kind of get a sense of, um, well, the early girl. We have marketable and unmarketable, too. So we're, just, we're still trying to get a feel for what data to collect. But um, blossom and rot seems more prevalent um, in some varieties more than others. Um, this is a, some snapshots of gathering together farms dry farm trial, um, early, mid, and late season, the pictures on the right, and receiving absolutely no irrigation. That site, we did notice a really high water table. Like when we were um, 
getting ready to plant. They were digging tomato trellising adjacent to that field, and there was um, standing water about three feet down. So another thing to look at when assessing a site is um, where the water table's at when you're planting, because we planted those tomatoes about a foot deep, and they were tapping into that water table pretty quickly. So um, just some real quick wrap up here. Um, we noticed the dry farming varieties um, standing out. Um, another thing that we noticed over all the sites was the dry farm melons, tomatoes, potatoes were um, ripening and becoming, uh, were ready for harvest more quickly. And we noticed like in the collaborative research sense that people have different capacities and interests for collecting data and, um, but they still want to be involved. So as we move forward, we'll be trying to figure out ways to engage the people depending, you know, despite what level. Some of them really want to go deep into the data. Some of them just simply want to show up for the meetings and, and cheerlead. Um, some other interests for the growers are no-till options, mulching, and definitely a huge interest in this um, dry farm seed share and cultivar development collaboratively. And, uh, we, and I think kind of what we're essentially doing as we move forward in this, um, this project gains momentum is co-creating the future of how we manage water on the farm, water on all of our farms. So our next steps is the project is growing exponentially in um, next year, and I'm so grateful for uh, Chrissy Lucas has um, helped me a lot, and Anna Duncan has stepped on as a project intern because I'm part-time with Extension, and this project is way bigger than me, so I'm so happy to have um, people that want to be involved. Um, so we're expanding, um, de developing some resources, and... Um, these are some recommendations for those new to dry farming. Start small, expand on your successes, tap into our network because there's a lot of uh, growers with lots of knowledge involved. And um, here's some resources. Like for um, more information, you can visit our website. We have a dry farming demonstration page. The videos are at the WMS um, at, that, um, at that address. And we have upcoming events that we'll be at presenting in more detail in more time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy, and I can attest to that produce. I had the opportunity to go down to Corvallis last summer, and those tomatoes, I probably ate about five in a row, like an apple from Jacques Newcomb's box of tomatoes. Oh my goodness, absolutely beautiful produce. All right. And Steve brought some, so we're really switching gears, dry farming to um, water efficiency with um, irrigation. And yes, yeah, Steve was kind enough to bring a hose. I'm um, showing this is uh, Lisa irrigation system, so. As it mentioned in the bio, I'm Steve Shively. I'm from Mud Lake, Idaho. And I'm gonna talk to you today about the Lisa pivot irrigation method. Uh, my history, I'm from Mud Lake, Idaho. And as you can see on the slide right here, there's the little town of Mud Lake. Uh, it's just north and west of Idaho Falls or straight west of Rexburg in eastern Idaho. I am a fourth generation far family farmer and we have had some of the ground over 70 years in our name. Um, it's my dad, myself, one full-time co-worker and we hire two or three sometimes uh, seasonal workers depending on the year. Uh, we get help from our spouses as well. We raise primarily alfalfa, wheat, uh, malt barley and Occasionally we raise silage corn for the dairy industry and we cash rent some of our ground for potato rotation. Our water comes from Mud Lake. There is a man-made lake in Mud Lake. Um, our canal irrigation district, the majority of our farm, the water does come from Mud Lake water users which covers approximately 24,000 acres in our Mud Lake area. 
We do have some farm ground that comes from another irrigation district, Jefferson Canal, which is deep water pumped out of wells into a canal system. And we have a small portion of our farm that is directly fed from the deep wells into the pivots. And our farm is 85% pivot irrigation. Mud Lake and the, the upper Snake River region here, well, most of the region has a high desert climate. So if we don't have any water irrigation, you're not going to dry farm. <laughs> Just a different area. Um, we studied the Lisa. Yeah, it was primary flood irrigation up until the 90s. That's how flat we are. Then in the late 80s, early 90s, some of the pivots, not so much pivots, hand lines, then wheel lines, and then it's progressed to pivots. And now the majority of the farm ground in our valley is pivot irrigation. When I heard about Lisa, I had started looking for ways that we could save energy and save water and be more effective. Uh, we can have times where we'll have 20, 30 mile an hour winds for maybe a week straight. And so it makes it hard to irrigate with pivot irrigation with those kind of winds. And so I was looking for ways that we could save some energy as well as increase our application with the water. And so we started looking into Lisa and we studied Lisa in 2015 with the help of Howard Niebling, who has worked here with Troy Peters from WSU also, and Dick Stroh through Bonneville Power. So in 2015, we put uh, one pivot span of the pivot into the Lisa, and Howard came and set up his moisture monitor meters and the control of the, the old part of the pivot and then the new part, and we studied that in Alpha Alpha for 2015. And then during the summer of 2015, there was talk of the Surface Water Coalition Agreement. And basically the Surface Water Coalition Agreement is any of the farmers down in the lower region of the state that get their water from surface water out of the Snake River, which comes from American Falls or up at uh, Palisades, those surface water users felt like the groundwater users up in the well, in all of the Eastern Snake Plain Aquifer, this ESPA, the surface water users felt like the groundwater users were impacting their water down here on this end. So they started trying to negotiate a, an agreement between the Surface Water Coalition and the uh, groundwater users, trying to figure out how we could reduce consumption to help them. Otherwise, they were going to take their senior rights down here and go to the state and say, we want everybody up here shut off. And so that was the start of the Surface Water Coalition and that was the reasoning behind it. So that started coming about in 2015, the discussions. And in the winter and spring of 2016 was when the agreement was made. And that called for an average of 13% reduction in water consumption based on your water rights. If you had an older water right like a lot of our Mud Lake water users' rights is 1930s, 1940s. So we were considered fairly senior. So some of our reduction was only 6 to 7%. There's some in the Hamer area up here that's 70s and 80s. So they're reducing 16, 17%. But on average, it was supposed to reduce 13%. And so knowing that the Surface Water Coalition was, agreement was coming and seeing what we had done with our study in 2015, that led us to installing four LISA pivots for the spring of 2016, for the irrigation season of 2016. And another reason for our uh, incentive to go to this was Rocky Mountain Power had incentive programs. They'd come out and study the efficiency of the pivot and if you could increase the water efficiency and save energy, they would do a cost share on the cost of the Lisa package. And some of those incentives on our pivots were anywhere from 29% up to 57% of the cost of the Lisa equipment. So I'll kind of show you now and I'll leave it up here so you can see what the Lisa. So the, the ram's head, as they call it, up at the top, goes on the, the drop of the pivot. You remove the existing drop. 
and then these hoses will hang down and you have the, the spray nozzle and the weight on the bottom of it that helps it run through the crop. So we'll go over some of the details of the, the setup now. Uh, the LEASA acronym, there's two ways, two, two different, uh, some call it low elevation spray application, or I've also heard it called low energy spray application, which it can fit both, both uh, dis descriptions. It was adapted to Idaho by uh, Howard Niebling and through Troy Peters through U of I and WSU. It origin, originated a lot in Texas where they have such high temperatures and they're trying to increase efficiency during those scorching summer months. You use a six or a 10 PSI regulator. So this, this here's the regulator that you use, either a six or a 10 PSI regulator. So the water coming into it may be 20 or 30 pounds pressure and so then you'll reduce it down to the six or the 10. And then you change the nozzle spacing. Like on our pivots, our current nozzle spacing was 108 inches apart. Well, now we're putting two, now we're put, putting two nozzles off of each old nozzle. And so we're reducing that spacing from 108 inches down to 54 inches. And you'll see later where, where it shows looking through the pivot at them. So a current nozzle, a current pivot span with 20 nozzles will now have 40. And we leave the inside one or two towers with the old um, Mesa irrigation method, which is the one that has the nozzles up higher. And the reason we do this is it's such a small amount of acres that the, the higher water consumption on that inside isn't is significant because you're talking maybe five acres or less out of 135. And when you start doubling the nozzles inside, it's such a small flow that you have an issue possibly with some plugging or debris or something because some of our water is ditch fed. And so that's why we felt that it's best to keep the inside as it was. The spray plate as I was holding it up there, the spray plate, we try to keep it between 14 and 18 inches off of the ground. And you have to keep in mind that as you install these on the pivot, that's without water in it. Once that pivot span is filled, it can sag three to four inches lowering this spray plate. So you're shooting for the 14 to 18 inches with water in the pivot. You're reducing the operating operating pressure of each pivot by five to ten psi, which results in the energy saving. And we're increasing the water application efficiency by ten to fifteen percent or more, fairly easily in what we've done so far. Uh, and we've also found that it works best. Say you were irrigating at like a half an inch per irrigation previously, we increase it to maybe three quarters or one inch. And then that also gives kind of the leaching effect of, of the water in the nozzles as it's putting it down. So the picture on the left is the new LISA method that we're using. And the picture on the right is the, the MESA method. So these photos were taken on May 16th um, irrigation for us typically starts around the 1st of May and these photos were taken within 10 minutes of each other and only a half mile apart and there was a slight breeze that day. So if you can see the water is coming out of these nozzles just barely above the the winter wheat right here. The winter wheat hadn't quite got tall enough to to grow around the nozzles. This is an alfalfa field with the old mesa nozzles and you can see the mist and the water in the air that you're losing. And here's a couple more pictures. So this is another picture looking down the inside of the, the nozzle. So you can see how we hang it off of each side of the pivot progressively as we move down the pivot. 
And so we had finished this pivot, installing it, and had it running. So you can see the inside tower that is still the Mesa nozzles, and then it drops to the Lisa nozzles, and you can see how much less water and atomization there is. And then this is the little half spray nozzle out on the end of the pivot. And I wanted to point out that here, over a mile away, that's the neighbor's pivot that is using this old irrigation method. And there was just the same slight breeze that day. This is a yield trial that we did last year in winter wheat. Uh, in 2015, with the old irrigation method, we had five Norwest 553 was the variety of wheat. The yield was 110.79 bushel. The gross irrigation, that's how much we recorded and put down with the pivot, 18.5 inches. And per the NRCS and the, the Agrimet station that they use, and these records were combined and submitted through the NRCS, we put down 22 and a half inches of total water. Now we fast forward to 2016. It was in winter wheat also. It was a different variety. It was Keldon, but it was still hard red winter. The yield was 125 bushel, so we gained 15 bushel. This is the biggest difference, the gross irrigation method. This was with the new Lisa nozzles. We only used 11 inches. And some might say, well, maybe it rained more. Maybe it was hotter. According to the NRCS, we had half the amount of rain for 2016 than we did in 2014. So we saved over 7.5 inches of gross irrigation just by changing that method. Um, and we also had Rocky Mountain Power because they did the cost share. We verified energy savings at the end of 2016 and they verified an annual power savings of 31,000 kilowatt hours per year on that specific pivot. This was one of our greatest savings of the pivots that we converted and the reason, reason being was that this pivot was on a variable frequency drive at the end of a mile of PVC mainline. So we were able to dial down the pressure on that mainline because it passed through two pivots upstream to get to this end one. 135. Here's some more pictures in wheat. Um, here's the Lisa nozzles on the boom as they hang down. And the reason they stop right here is the rest of this boom of this pivot goes over an irrigation canal. So we can't have the hoses driving, dragging across the canal. And so we had to leave these old nozzles. And it's a little harder to tell in this picture, but you can see uh, that the grain is still green and quite a bit taller. And then you hit out here at the edge and it starts drying down due to the lower efficiency. And then this is another picture. This was uh, the Lisa package on the pivot. And this was after the water had been shut off and was preparing for harvest. Um, some of the benefits that we've also found is reduced lodging in the grain because the nozzles are now dragging through the grain instead of on top wetting down the heads of the grain, making it heavy. So we found reduced lodging and also uh, reduced disease pressure. And this is an alfalfa yield comparison that we also did this year. Um, what it was is the same pivot that we studied with Howard Niebling on 2015, we reversed it. In 2015, we had just a small section that was Lisa and the rest of it was all the old nozzles. Well, now we converted it all to Lisa except for one little section. And so these tests were 36 feet wide, which is two paths with our swather. And so everything was fertilized the same. Everything was irrigated the same. Everything was cut the same day. And so when we went to harvest, and I'll show some pictures of this, on first crop with the old nozzles was 11 and a half bales. And we have an electronic bale length control on our baler, so I can track exactly how much goes through that baler. So first crop, we had 11 and a half bales on the old system. And with the Lisa, we had 11.68. And second crop, it started getting more significant. And the reason being, first crop, we still have snow moisture. We have some spring rains. After that, the desert effect kicks in and our rains go down. So second crop, we went from 6.42 bales to 9.26. Third crop, it almost doubled. 3.97 versus 6.94. So there's the total bales 
And then we haven't marketed this hay, so it's still sitting in the stack. So I estimated them at 1,900 pounds average. It comes out 3.77 tons per acre versus 4.65. That's an average yield increase of 0.88 tons per acre on 11.7 inches of water. And these show the pictures. This top one is the first crop. And right here at the wheel track starts the trial and it goes in for 36 feet. You can't really tell on first crop. Second crop, and here's one of Howard's meters, you can start to see the, the difference. And third crop was even more significant. And that pivot saved 6,905 kilowatt hours installing that. So in summary, in fall of 2016, we found water savings of up to 40% while maintaining equal to or greater yields. Uh, we we're easily able to meet our water reductions. And we also verified the energy savings that I talked about. So in 2017, we plan to install the lease, lease irrigation on another six of our 18 pivots. And this, is, this shows one of the other trials we did in 2015. So real quick, a funny story. This was one of them that Howard converted in winter wheat. So this was the old system, then the new system, and then the old was out here. So I had a voicemail when I got up early one morning, and the voicemail came at 5.30, and the ag pilot had called, uh, I'm not sure what you got going on, but one of my pilots just flew over this pivot, and for some reason, the inside five towers in here are working, and the end is working, but that sixth one is plugged. You might want to go check it out. <laughs> And before I could get back to him, the sunlight had came up, and he says, okay, I see the hoses. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. That was great. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for this opportunity. And I'm so glad that I'm just after Steve because he has he's put the exclamation point of what I'm going to try and say here to you. And I think the statement is really true now. The time is right to optimize on your system. And I want to start with this little story. I heard it on the TV news about a month ago. This guy stood up and he says, we're going to make this instrument. It's going to be a phone. It's going to be possible to go onto the internet going to be possible to take pictures, do all sorts of things. That was Steve Jobs 10 years ago. That was the first iPhone. It was the first smartphone. And we think of having these forever. It was only 10 years ago. There was no smartphone available. Now, the same kind of development has been happening in agriculture. Some people haven't been paying attention. Maybe people are slower to adjust. But I want to point out some of the new developments and I want to show you that I think the time is right really to be able to to move along. So what we really mean by optimization here is really just getting the best out of the, your existing system. And that could be no upgrading, it could be as simple as going from a MESA system to a LISA. And you've already heard about the numbers. And even if water comes to you free, there are other elements to look at. Maybe there is the added yield you could get. Maybe there is saving in these three pivots, which means you can, you can put more, more product in the ground and so on. So upgrading, incorporating new sensors and data to help you understand what you, what's happening clearer. And then the last thing is bring it all together in computer software that makes it really easy to, to see and understand and implement. When I talk to people about upgrading, first they, they say there is the cost. Now, thanks to Steve again, when you look at the numbers that he had there, first of all, there is incentive programs available in many cases, and the, the saving that he's had from electric, pumping electricity, that probably pays for, for the rest of his cost, and it certainly will in the near term if it didn't in year one. 
Then the next thing is the complexity. People say, well, I need to look at the weather forecast here, I need to look at pivot status there, I need to look at um, soil moisture status there. Well, there is software available nowadays that will take all of this information, bring it onto one platform, and you can flash through the information and get it all compiled in one easy place with very little trouble. So let's look at, there are mainly orchards and pivots, and uh, it works equally well for that. So when we say we want to optimize on our irrigation system, let's look at a couple of sprinkler instances. And um, the sec second thing is you want to install some sensors so that you know what is your current flow, your pressure in your system, and that talks to uh, VFDs and so on. If you're running pumps, you want to know how hard they're working, what the weather is and then we'll take a quick look at the IWM software. Now I have some numbers here that is not from research and uh, I think uh, Troy Peters might be cringing in his seat there. This is numbers that I have found in practice. If you have these sprinklers and we've, I've been working with irrigation water management for 20 years with uh, particularly looking from the soil up with soil moisture sensors starting with tensiometers, neutron probes, electronic probes and these are the real life numbers that I have found. If you have a large radius impact sprinkler, the efficiency there is inherently low. And I have some numbers there, but I want to show it to you graphically. This is what I have found in practice. If you have a large old sprinkler throwing water out there, the efficiency can be as low as 40%. That means that other 60% disappeared between the time it left the nozzle and by the time it got to the root zone. That's the evaporation. Now, you add to that high wind, low humidity, high temperature, and you're throwing it on the canopy over a large area, and most of it evaporates. So inherently, you just cannot get much better than that. And as the radius of your sprinkler decreases, the efficiency goes up and up and up. And the idea really is don't throw it out in the air, don't throw it on the ground, get it in the ground. And remember, this, these are the numbers from between the nozzle and what gets to the root zone. Here's a practical example. A um, cherry orchard, older spacing, they had impact sprinklers, pulled it out, went to a smaller radius, and not particularly small, but a smaller radius, a micro sprinkler, and now we're leaving the section dry in here. That was just grass anyway. So he was growing a lot of grass, he had to come back and cut it. Now he's putting the water under the tree and coming up with a tremendous saving. Other parts of the world where water is even scarcer, this is from South Africa, poor soil, they had to ridge it up to get something to grow the apples on, designed a very small radius, and I'm talking 18 inch radius micro sprinkler. High density trees, one per tree, and you can see that this system puts all the water right on, on that ridge. No waste, very efficient, and now you can see that you, you bring in the radius in putting the water where it's absolutely needed. Some novel ideas with new designs with micro sprinklers to keep them out of harm's way, hanging on a, on a line. And this is here from the, the wet Matawa district. This is a gravelly soil. One would think this is not a good place to have um, drip irrigation, but these, this company went from impact sprinklers, reduced it down to a double drip system and clear cultivated and they are growing good quality good yield cherries in those circumstances being very efficient and everyone's familiar with uh, drip irrigation in wine grapes that's often used keep it elevated and that is very efficient use of of irrigation water getting back to the to the conversion and trials this was a study done by dr frank Yun. <coughs> Um, of the extension office in uh, Hood River. It goes back to 2006. In the Dalles, the reference ET for that year was 41 inches. So this is cherry orchard, 16 by 18, so 151 trees per acre. And normally there is a micro sprinkler system in there, a small micro with 15 gallons per hour. And we actually had flow meters on this and we were using 5,000 gallons per tree to grow the crop there and it was a, a randomized trial. Some sections got double drip irrigation, so same trees, same everything. We were using exactly half that amount of water. 
And of course, they had to test the, the yield, the quality of the fruit, the firmness and everything. The fruit was exactly the same. The yield was the same. So here is a case where the grower is pumping this water out of a well. Every gallon costs him money. And just by converting the irrigation system, he has cut in half the amount of pumping costs while keeping the yield and the quality exactly the same. This, these are the actual numbers. It's a little confusing, but these are the actual numbers from that trial. Uh, they were doing different things with straw mulch, no cover, other things. But here's the number I want you to see. Under normal circumstances, he would be using 2.3 acre foot with the double drip, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 1.1, 1 .1. massive savings. And again, for exactly the same yield and quality of fruit. And just turning it into numbers, if you took a look at these efficiencies, if you're saying that you're doing it with a, with a drip line, you might be using 377,000 gallons. If you go to a small micro, it goes up and up and up. And this is to achieve the exact same end result. Again, just looking at the efficiency of the system. This is a trial uh, done with the Farmers Irrigation District a couple of years ago. And the, the trial was based on taking a section that a grower had under impact sprinkler. So we monitored that for a year with flow meters and everything else. And in the next season, they converted to some other form of irrigation, micro sprinkler. Same tree, same, same area, same flow meter. We, we normalized it for the, the reference ET for the year and for the small change in rainfall. And this is what what came out of it. Depending on what they did, this grower selected a double drip system, he saved 57%. But everyone saved over that, on, and on average, there was a 32% saving. In this case, we did the calculation and, and found that if they converted all the impact sprinklers to micros, that saving there, if they could take that water, push it through the turbines, could probably pay for the conversion project. And I was happy to hear Les say that they have actually converted 90% of the impact by now. So it's working. Then when we get to spring, um, pivot irrigation, and again, thanks to Steve, he's, he's already done the talking for me, so I'm gonna just flash through this. And when you have a typical Mesa sprinkler, this is in the Columbia Basin, those sprinklers are probably eight foot off the ground, and this is a mint field, which is not gonna get much higher than 18 inches. So there is really no need to have these sprinklers so high, and I remember this day, it was so wet on the road that I had to turn on my, my windshield wipers going through them. Then if you, go, if you use the same, drop it down to a Lisa, you can immediately see the advantage just by keeping the water out of the air, getting it into the ground. And LIPA, where you bring it even lower, low application, precision application, even higher. And you can see this is corn, so when the corn gets up and the, it's under the canopy very quickly, you have a very high application efficiency. And uh, right here, if you're not familiar with Dr. Troy Peters, he is the, the expert in these things, so, so please talk to him about it. And this is a, a new development, uh, and I just... I'll just call it a drag drip, where you're actually taking drip, drip line, um, adjusting by length for the, for the radius that you're in, and literally dragging it in the row. So now you're planning in circles, and they drag it along. So this is drip irrigation in motion, so to speak. So you're getting it, this, it's right on the ground from the word go. So that was converting your irrigation system. And you can see there are many ways uh, the tests have been done, the studies are in, it is worth doing, and in many cases, it'll pay for itself. And then we, we go to the next level, and that is making use of additional sensor information. And, and I have brought a, a sample here as well. This is a modern profile soil moisture probe. Inside of here, we have five sensors every four inches. This will be planted in a field down to this level, connected to telemetry. And that, that is a typical piece of telemetry by this company. And not as sexy as the, the iPhone, but inside of here, it has the same Verizon modem. This is 
this is a data logger connected to a cell phone modem sending data to us as often as we want, typically once an hour. Combination, we know exactly where the, the plant is taking the water, how often it's taking, and that makes it possible for us to combine all of this information. Now we're not just optimizing our irrigation system, now we're also optimizing the intervals. Oh, and I'm showing you AgSense. There are a myriad of systems, some cell phones, some radio, some satellite, that you can bring this data in. And we have this in the southern parts of, of Idaho, off the Snake River, where there is no cell reception. We used um, satellite to get the data out. So if you can combine these things, you want to know what the weather is doing, what the soil moisture status is, you, you want to know what the weather forecast is, you want to know what your moisture status is, where your pivot is, what it's doing. We can even generate a, a variable speed prescription or a variable rate prescription. And if you can bring it all together, you have one happy farmer knowing exactly how to respond to the situation. So this is what it looks like in, in software, for instance. We have soil moisture status normalized, so irrespective of the soil type, you could say you can see the soil moisture status. We have further detail in here. You see the, the, the five bubbles. That's the five sensors within the probe, so we know exactly what's happening down there. So we have a field name. I can see the data age that I'm looking at, the signal strength, battery status, and here is where we start with the science. A, the calculated number of days for this field to go from where it is now to run dry. So this grower has eight days available. He knows what the deficit is in inches. He can tune his, his application rate to that. If this is an orchard with solid set, he can tell you the hours required and show you the current status. And on the same dashboard, you can switch, see flow meters, see map reports, see yields, and see forecasts, see your calculations, see a spray forecast, which means going to one screen, you can get all of your data nicely interpreted um, and for you to work in. This is a real farm where the guy has 40 sensors in the ground, 40 different sites. He's done it as a priority list. And what did it take us? One second to realize there's like five, five sites that needs attention. Uh, there's something happening. It's not getting enough water. There's two down here, three maybe that's getting too much water. So within a flash, we know exactly where to pay attention today and what needs, what needs to be fixed. You can click on that, get the detailed picture of what the actual status is. You see the, the irrigation sets and the rundown. We have a management refill point there. We can look at this in, in detail per sensor. And then you can see, for instance, the purple line. He was irrigating a little too deep. Stop that. And you can see the subsoil slowly drying out. And now you know you're not pushing water through the profile. You can get a widget that shows you the, the probe depths, the soil, the soil, the classification, and everything else. Y East is working on a, a new project where we'll come up with a, a very easy to read indicator it's showing pump, pump system efficiency, first of all. But in there, you will have information like the current flow, the, the pressure, and also the irrigation efficiency. And this will take into account the, the sprinkler design. And that goes back to the Mesa versus Lipa. Include current wind conditions from the weather station, current temperature, current hour rate, so that you can see what, what is actually happening. So, for instance, this is now really just a spray forecast based on wind, but you could do the same thing and put dollar signs on there and show the grower what is it going to cost you to be pumping water this time of day. And if you have that information and this information where you can see you have 10 days' time available, that means you can select when to pump, for instance, you might say, I'm not going to be pumping these hours of the day, and I'm not going to be pumping on Friday either. It's, it looks like Wendy's. So I say that the time is right to optimize. The information is available. The system can pay for itself, or there is incentives that will help you pay for it, and no more excuses. <laughs> Thank you.
So we do have some time for a couple of questions. We're just going to uh, go into lunch just a tiny bit, but uh, Liz gave us a little bit of space, so don't worry, there will be food. No one's going to be hungry. Uh, so actually, if I can ask our panelists to just come back up here, maybe just stand or sit, whatever you feel like, uh, and we'll take some questions. Hi, I guess my question is, why would I do all of this if I'm a senior uh, water rights user? Why would I invest into it? I'll go first on that. I think uh, senior water rights is not a clever design, and I think if they could do it over again, they would. You can see I'm not a Republican, I'm not a local. I think somewhere in the future, it'll have to be renegotiated one way or another. Um, like the gentleman mentioned, mentioned earlier that manages the Rosa Irrigation District, those guys that have the senior rights, they don't feel like they need to. I've got my water, I don't need to change. But uh, I'm also on the, the canal board, the Mud Lake Water Users, that serves the 24,000 acres. And there's been some serious discussion the last two or three months, especially since the Surface Water Coalition Agreement has gone into effect, and we're going to have to start making reductions. Um, instead of being a flat assessment like we have before, we're discussing going to a pay-for-what-you-use situation. So then it doesn't matter if you're senior or junior or whatever. If the senior doesn't want to reduce water, that's fine, but he's going to pay more than the guy that's using less. And that's what we've gotten into because we're raising a crop now on 10, 11, 12 inches of water. We're allotted up to three and a half acre feet. But we're paying the same for our 10 or 11 inches as a guy next door who's using three feet. And so I think that's where a lot of it is going to start to head towards is a pay for what you use instead of just a flat assessment. Hi, I think this is probably mostly for Amy. Um, and my question is, um, for dryland farming, how practical is it for uh, farmers to switch back and forth between, say, a dry and an irrigated scenario? And if it is practical, how much warning would a grower need to know that a dry year was coming? How useful would that forecast be? Um, I don't think I have a, a good answer for that. There are examples of farms. Um, one in Philomath, Gathering Together Farm, is uh, they're con continuing with their irrigated crop production, but they're, um, because there's a niche market for the dry farm tomatoes, customers are really excited about them. They're allotting some space for irrigated tomatoes. So there are farms that are doing both irrigated and dry farm crops to kind of tap into this opportunity, but I don't... Um, no, I mean, everybody's in a different situation. Some farms that are working with us on this project simply don't have water rights, so they don't have an opportunity to alternate between. Some are using it as a tool to stagger harvest or tap into niche marketing opportunities. So, um, But I don't know of anyone that is full-on dry farmed and then you know alternating between irrigated and dry farmed from year to year. I hope that answers a little bit. Okay, I have a question for the two gentlemen. Um, how widespread is Lisa, um, would you say, in sort of the western region? And then for you, uh, Jacques, with the double drip, um, is it pretty much necessary to have um, all the weeds or the grasses sprayed out for that to, function, to really effectively function? Um. The Lisa system in Idaho is relatively young. Like you say, it was originated in Texas where they're dealing with the Ogallala aquifer and its shortage. So it's relatively young in Idaho. Uh, in our valley alone, I don't know how many acres would encompass our area that serves basically our school district as kind of our farming community. But uh, 
last year when Howard, in 2015, when Howard came in and did this study, we were the first one in the valley to do the, the LISA system. He had done some about 50 to 60 miles to the west of us and, and done some farther south to Twin Falls. But because of the Surface Water Coalition Agreement, during 2016, I could think of probably at least 20 pivots now that have the LISA system. We're just faced with that challenge. Either you cut reduction or we're going to go to the state and try and get the state to come after you to, to shut off and save our water. So it's still relatively young, but I think it's going to grow pretty drastically in the next two or three years. In terms of the double drip, there is no specific requirement. That happened to be a very nice, clean, cultivated. But you would do it just the way you normally do. Make sure you keep the, the drip line out of the, the way of the uh, swath, swather and so on. But uh, it is inherently more efficient because you're putting the water right on the ground and most of it goes in rather than stays on the leaves. But as you know, weeds and grass is, is very aggressive and can compete very effectively with trees. So particularly with young trees, it's important to, to keep it fairly clearly cultivated to give your tree a good start. But if you're irrigating for a deeper root zone, um, it works as well as any microsystem. This is a question for Steve. Um, with the Lisa, as your crops are growing above the spray heads, do you have to make adjustments to how much water you're spraying? Um, how quick, you know, what the flow is like? Uh, the flow stays the same on the Lisa all throughout the season. But if you didn't notice, there's a one pound weight on here that helps hold the nozzle down. So as the grain or the hay or the corn, they've done it in corn, as it gets taller, it'll just cover it up. And so that's where the drastic savings in water comes, is now you're applying that water under the surface of the plant. And so that helps shield the water from the, the wind and the high temperatures. And so having that crop covering that up really, really increases the efficiency. But that's also where you have to slow the pivot down, because then you've got the crop kind of restricting these nozzles, reaching from one nozzle to the other. And so it, it's key to start out slow and build the soil profile. And then that way, as the crop gets taller and you start to get some restriction from the crop material around the nozzles, you've got that profile built up. And then as you keep it slow, it will basically leach out and cover from nozzle to nozzle. Any more questions for the panel members? So the problem that we have with encouraging uh, conservation in, in uh, Southern Oregon is that there are few energy costs for applying water because they come out of ditches and it's gravity feed. And our challenge is not going from, say, high, high volume impact sprayers to low volume or drip. Our challenge is going from flood irrigation for hay fields on hillsides to anything more efficient than that. And there doesn't seem to be, because we pay, as, as, as you pointed out, per acre, not by how much you use, there's no um, motivation, really, for somebody to invest in something to be more efficient. Uh, and this is my question for Jacques. Uh, doing uh, irrigation scheduling, which is the, the tools that you introduced help people know when to irrigate and how much, what kind of savings by just doing the timing of irrigation properly is typical and what kind of savings are possible? I guess two different questions. This adds on to the question the gentleman had there behind you. And when there is no incentive for water saving, then you need to look at your crop. And uh, it's a pity I don't have a graph of it, but it's been studied. And if you, if you draw the graph between yield and water applied, you have a, a, a growing curve and it reaches an apex. 
And if you keep pouring on water, that curve actually starts coming back down. So if you are over irrigating, not only is it uh, creating conditions where pathogens can spread and, and other diseases can thrive, you're actually reducing yield. So again, knowing what you have, knowing the status, and then correctly timing that, it might be good for your pocketbook anyway in terms of your yield and product quality by dialing back. So if the crop needed two and a half acre foot and you were putting on three, you might not see the difference. But if you dialed back, you would have a healthier crop and possibly a bigger crop but while applying less water. So even if that's the only reason, that's a good reason for doing it. We find that in, in fruit a lot. If you over irrigate fruit, it ends up in the taste. And this goes back to dry land. The, uh, there is even something to be said for slightly deficit irrigating so that you don't go for the maximum size but go for maximum quality. And there are people that would pay extra for that. And then to, to Troy's question, what we find when we start working with growers, if they've never done anything with looking at what they're doing, looking at timing, irrigation, and we come in with uh, instrumentation like this and help them, we find almost without exception a 20% saving, just right off the bat. And then if they're willing to tweak that and get, get away from that 100% application to 90%, sometimes we can get to to higher, like 30%. So if you, if you apply that with more efficient irrigation systems, in other words, these are all incremental savings, but from doing nothing to optimizing your system to applying technology, you can probably save 40% all in all. And that's a huge number. Wonderful. Thank you, Jacques, Steve, and Amy. And thanks to uh, Gabrielle for moderating the session. Uh, <laughs>